Oak Run Slough area, Salinas River, Lower uh, Carmel River, Carmel River Mouth, a few other places. Now's the time to go out there and see all of the shore groups, sandpipers, um, and all that stuff. There's cool, um, pretty scarce rare species being seen now. There's buried sandpiper at the Carmel River Mouth. There's um, semi palmated sandpiper, which looks a lot like western sandpiper being seen around Elk Run Slough and, uh, and Salinas River Mouth. So, point being, fall migration, which is the birders' heaven, is well underway. Start with shorebirds, then move to songbirds, then move to waterfowl. Um, so, enjoy that while it lasts. If you don't know, I'm Blake Matheson, the president of Monterey Audubon. We meet the, for those of you who don't know, the second Tuesday of every month here at the PG Museum and has been doing since the Big Bang, basically, so um, it's pretty reliable. Uh, I t sometimes we get two or three months in advance, sometimes we can't get a speaker till a couple weeks out, so just, you know, when the beginning period of the month starts rolling around, just check the website. And we do have a lot of really cool field trips, um, tailored for beginning birding, mindful birding, all kinds of birding uh, that are occurring off and on. So, and I would also just, you know, be, for you guys who are conservation minded, on our board here, um, there's a really nice piece organized, supported by hard science, put out by Cornell Ornithology Lab on what are the actual things that you can do in your life that make a really big difference for birds. So take a little picture of that in the upper left hand corner as you leave and when you just comes up in passing conversation with your friends about what could you actually do to help birds, pick a couple things off that list because it's the real thing. Um, so today I'm thrilled to have uh, Paul visiting us, who's come down from Sacramento, involved in Sacramento Audubon, um, to talk about, I think, uh, a surprisingly emergent and um, really important subject matter and birds that really goes along with um, <clears throat> building a bigger and bigger, more effective advocacy base for birds and bird conservation, right, as things get more pointedly urgent. And so, um, Part of that is getting people who care a lot about birds fully engaged as, and as engaged as they can be with the resource we all care about. Um, speaking of people who care about birds a lot, our environmental advocate, Amanda Fries, <laughs> um, who's been with us for, uh, officially a little under a year in her uh, warrior capacity, but as a volunteer board member for many years before that. Um, say hi to Amanda, we'll say a few more. Thanks, Blake. Hey there, everybody. Yes, I have Amanda. I can have you all. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, this is our monthly Audubon presentation, as Blake said. Um, I was going to say thank you to the PG Museum for hosting us, as usual. Like Blake said, it's reliably the second Tuesday of every month. Here we will be. Um, and I think Paul's presentation is really like the perfect way to kick off this latter part of our year, because Monterey Audubon has been working really hard to provide an accessible bird walk every month and we've really been you know reaching out to specific community groups to try to coordinate more inclusive outdoor activities that can open the door for people who may not have maybe seen themselves as birders in the past um, and so you know my goal has always been to share you know the joy and the love that arises from spending time observing birds and connecting with them and just ex exploring our beautiful natural world and I've been so lucky to have this amazing person who just appeared out of nowhere, like magic one day, Beverly Gatliff up here, super motivated and super kind. And she's been helping me um, organize these mindful bird walks and planning all these different outreach and events. So she's been super wonderful to have. I just wanted to make sure to say thank you and recognize Bev. Um, and so tonight we're really proud to be hosting Paul Miller, who's the president of Sacramento Audubon, and he's a birdability representative, and he'll be talking a bit more about birdability, I believe, which is a separate nonprofit from Audubon, but a, a wonderful organization. And he's been really promoting a more inclusive approach to birding and leading accessible bird walks up at Sacramento Audubon. And I'm really pleased that all of us, you know, all these different groups are collectively realizing that our organizations and our, our conservation efforts are really stronger from you know uh, bringing in people from different backgrounds different birding styles and i think it's really going to make us all stronger and better and we'll be able to help the birds better 
Um, so I'm really excited to hear Paul's story and learn about all the different amazing tools he's developed because he's really quite the MacGyver and there's a lot of stuff that he's working on that's really kind of cutting edge and no one's thought about. So he's really breaking ground on this one. So I'll turn it over to Paul and we'll start out with adaptive optics. Thank you, Amanda. How are we doing on the lapel mic? Can you hear? Yes. All right, great. So, I always love how things happen. And the fact that I'm here giving a presentation was never on my radar my entire life. And the fact that I'm here is because of them. And the reason that I got involved heavily in Audubon and in all of the apparatus was literally just to go see birds. Um, so my story, and it connects right back up to that. Uh, I retired as a transportation planner. I was the guy giving presentations in traffic and you, know, you name it, support the supervisor, council, you know. Tall, six foot two, capable, walking around. I have a slowly progressive form of muscular dystrophy. And when I retired, I thought, well, I, I want to be active. I need to get out into nature. So a friend of mine invited me out to a seminar, Birds of Winter. Oh, Birds of Winter. It was a, a, a classroom, a presentation, but it also had a field trail. And because my much muscle atrophy is slowly progressive. What I could do last year isn't what I can do this year. So I thought, well, I'll go out and be able to use binoculars. So we go out and I went, uh-oh, I couldn't use binoculars. And so that started my journey. My journey was I want to see birds and I want to get immersed into Birds. I mean, I, I, I had never, I was always in the outdoors, I always loved the doctors, I always, but for whatever reason, I just, and I, 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 I'll chalk it up to my German ancestry, if there's something I can't do, it'll be something that I want to do, and I wanted to see the birds. So what I'm going to present to you is my journey, and it's only been five years, I've only been, uh, part of the board of Sacramento Audubon for a year and a half and president since July. And then it brings the story of Bev directly in um, because of what I'm going to talk about with the larger movement of vertibility and mindful bird. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to peel around the back and so everybody can look at my PowerPoint and then I've got a, a, a pointer and I can, I'll be able to point out various things. So we'll go with the PowerPoint and stop me if I'm going too fast or if there's any questions. If my wife were here, she would say, she's already talked to lunch. <laughs> And so 
coming back to my story, when I got to the point where I had a, some way to look through the diapers, I tried to join up with a Audubon field trip. And, you know, I'm a fairly confident person, but it was still very intimidating. And what vertibility is doing is, is working to really pull down those barriers and help anybody, even including people that are blind, which is amazing. So they're helping people that are blind find locations they can burn by here. So the Bible Burning Network, another one that I just uh, came across, um, and this has to do, and I'll just read this, mounting scientific research shows that deepening our experiences of nature by intentionally slowing down, engaging our senses, and being aware of the present moment holds a myriad of benefit for overall human progress. And so this one really spoke to me, because uh, I was kidding around with the gal who started uh, vertibility, and I said, you know, because she's an occupational therapist, and I kept telling her burning is therapy before I even realized that there's a large network of people that really are promoting. So what I like about this is I am a novice burger, I'll be a novice burger for another 20 years, but it doesn't matter. It's about getting out, and so I'm leading trips, and I'm starting with that. I don't know all the words, we'll figure them out together. So, my form of muscular dystrophy is that long word, muscular dystrophy, and it's a slowly progressive muscle wasting disease. I knew that I had it when I was 16, uh, but I was still capable, and I have done a lot of things. I've surfed, I have climbed mountains and everything, and I'm really glad that I did that. And it's the can do attitude that I think has brought me to the point where I'm at. So, and also with the FSHD murder, um, I just put that together because I'm on uh, Instagram and I have a website and just do something catchy that, that is you know, more of an Instagram number. Okay, so adaptive optics are really kind of my thing. And amazingly, uh, when I Googled it uh, two and a half years ago, there literally was nothing. There literally was nothing. And I'm a really good Google person. I actually <laughs> set up an in instant Google and every week it's like, no ball. And so it really is what started my, I was like, okay, I am, am I the crazy hermit in my garage building stuff? And then one day, vertibility came up. And so that is what brought that into focus. And so I've been helping them identify what I'm going to be showing you. Um, but really, when I got into this, there, there were no resources. And there was nobody that was, that was putting out there on the internet what they had to do. And obviously, other people were doing it, but it wasn't something I could uh, interact with. So, what are the types of depth of birth? There's the uh, mountain graphic. So, I'll talk about that uh, easier as I get into it. Handheld head, adjustable bottom pod, electric focus, and wheelchair on, electric brain on. So, let's start. So, how many of you know what that is and know what it attaches to? One, two, all right. So, um, so in fact, Bev, I was talking to her on Zoom. I said, okay, well, we need to get uh, you a binocular mountain bracket, uh, or they call it a tripod adapter, and uh, let's make sure that your binoculars are able to attach it to. And so she turned around and she tried to get it. So the front of all your binoculars um, is a little cap, and there is a screw hole, and this right here attaches to. So this right here uh, goes between the, the two lenses, and this is the attachment of the bottom. I'll show you the attachment. But I mean, it's a 
$10 part, and it allows you to attach your binoculars to any of to the tripod, to the monopod, to the workbench, to the pattern. Is that attached to the focusing mechanism? No. Where? So is it below the focusing mechanism? Oh, oh, sure. So I've got to think about that. So the pan tilt pad, most um, tripods have a built in pan tilt pad, but most, a lot of pods don't have, they have a really funky uh, one. And so getting this pan tilt pad um, has its uh, kind of discus um, in here so that as you move it, It'll actually stay in place. It doesn't just completely flop, which was really difficult. I had a, a ball head, and it was, you know, if you let go of it, all of a sudden it's like, and it's all there. Okay, so I think I'll have even a better one. But here's the adapter, and it fits between the two uh, optical, what we're going to call the binocular. So those are awkward. Uh, and you can see there's a the little screw in, it, in the middle. So then that, this is called a quick release. So you can pick them off with a pan tail. So monopods, so when you're trying to bird with a monopod and you've got a bird in a tree that's close to you and you have to go 45 degrees up, and I'm six foot two. I had to get a very, very, very long monopod because the binoculars really had to be up above my eye level. So what I found was that the professional um, camera uh, monopods usually would get above almost seven feet. And they're sturdy if you don't want the cheap one. So okay, here's the full setup. So here's the monopod, here's the pan tilt, here's the adapter, and here are so cool story is tomorrow for the most Lobos trip that we're taking, Ben is going to try this for the first time, and along with her walker. So I'm really looking forward to seeing how that goes. So when you're standing or in a seated position, adjusting the angle of the binoculars would require you to adjust the height of the monopod. So this is me in a seated position. And you can see if it's level. Uh, yeah. So the, oh no. So it's the red is level. So that's just the height. That, so this height here. So if you look down, you don't have to adjust it too far down because your head doesn't have to move too far down. So maybe a couple of inches. But this is the big one. So if, if you have to look up, with it attached to the monopod, then you've got to, and it, and it's, it gets a little funky because you've got to have a finger that's unlatching it, pulling it up, latching it, and by the time the bird's gone, <laughs> you know, it doesn't matter. By the time you look through it, the bird's gone. And then for me, being that I had to raise my arm all the way up here, what I'm going to be showing you next is the reason for that. So it became extremely difficult for me when I was still ambulatory to, I would throw my hand up there and, you know, rest it up on top, but I needed a therapy day the next day, you know, to get a little pain. So focusing the optics when viewing upwards requires extending your arm above your head. This may pose a challenge to some users. Let your focus when you focus the out. Now, this is where my wife would say, uh, okay, why do you think Paul is going off the tracks? Uh, because there's probably two people in all of California that would need what I'm going to be showing you next. <laughs> so, and again, this is me finding stuff online. None of this equipment was meant to be together. All of this is literally, so, this is for a telescope, holding the telescope tube. This behind here is actually a focusing, electric focusing for a telescope. This is a wheel for a toy. And I had to mount it all up to be able to get this to attach to the focusing knob to be able to, and then this has, this motor has a uh, wired uh, controller so you can focus it back and forth. 
It worked for a while for me, standing, but I'm telling you, it's heavy, difficult. And again, for the times of her, one, seeing it was amazing, and then trying to focus it hurts on that. So it was frustrating, very frustrating. So the same thing from the side, this is actually on my scope. So the scope, I wouldn't be standing because it wouldn't be stable enough. I'd be sitting on my walker if I had a wheelchair. So again, a lot of this was me chasing my dystrophy. I was still ambulatory. I was still using the monopod for support. And then I got a all-terrain walker that had wheels for the beach. And uh, through this whole process, my wife decided to call me the steampunk burger. <laughs> Okay, so optics on a modified, you can stand with them and walk. But again, you know, the electric focusing is fairly heavy, that becomes difficult. Um, you can use them in a seated position uh, or from the wheelchair. So this is me out my buddy's boat. Uh, this is literally with the whole apparatus with the, um, oops, with the uh, electric focus. And this allowed me in a seated position, especially from a boat, because you know, you're going around the lake, and this was really nice because I could be seated and I could ask my buddy, okay, we're going to go over here. And so everything was already set up, and the focusing was really quick, and that worked really well. So the equipment weight can be a problem while walking, especially with electronic focus added. One solution is a wheel walker or electric. So I actually came and brought Bev something similar to this. So this is um, literally a, like a uh, hole holder, if you want. So the, the bottom part, uh, that, 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 uh, this here is a, it's got an opening. So the bottom part staff, with, with, and Bev will show you later um, how that's set up. So that way you can actually walk with the walker and the monopod's already attached and so you don't have to deal with exactly what you want. So this is me, not, not with the monopod, but when I decided to do articulated arm and this uh, is attached to my walker. It's a one-time use because it is not practical. <laughs> I had to have, so, and people walking by me, I say, you have to take a picture because this is never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> this would actually, before I got my real wheelchair, as my wife called it, because the, the MacGyver wheelchairs, she wasn't comfortable with me being out in the middle of Timbuktu because she knew they would break because I built them. <laughs> so this um, was one that I built, and um, I was using spinning articulated arm. Um, I'm using the monopod with the monopod holder. And again, this worked really well um, with the ADA trails because this is with my scope. Um, and this is um, out at Kasunas River Preserve. So with all of the water birds coming in the fall, I mean, I didn't have to go very far. And having the scope and having the electric focus on it, I, I was out there for five hours before I even knew. So this is me with, uh, this is the photo that I use for uh, mobility. Uh, I'll show you, I've got this here with me, that's on the big wheel walker. So there's my big wheel walker. This was my, this was my trade-off, because I built a all-terrain, uh, as my wife would call it, death mobile. <laughs> she would not allow me out other than within the park area. So I said, if I take it apart, what do I get? She says, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. So this thing is quite the amazing production. It's from Australia, it's four wheel drive. Each wheel is a knobby tire that has 650 watt motor on it. It literally will go up a 45 degree sand. It won't stop, it goes anywhere. But here is what I realized that when I got it, uh, this has a uh, tilt. So this tilting, see me in the chair, it tilts it even tilts more than that. That did away with my need to have, to raise the monopod. 
So when I realized I had the tilt capabilities, I got rid of the bottom line. Then I also realized that with the armrest here, uh, I, to, you know, right now where my body is, I can get up and focus it without having, I can rest my arm on, on, the, on the rest. So I've done away right, for right now with the veteran focus. So this is, this is literally my burning, this is, this is it. Mm -hmm. Long, yeah, I love it. I can't say that, but. So my personal mobility issues still allow me to use uh, my arms and hands low shoulder level. So more severely disabled individuals uh, may require full power control options. So, you know, just like Bev, where, you know, she found me on vertibility design reference on your website, um, I got uh, um, approached uh, by uh, a woman that was involved with the CNC job on the uh, sports camera. And she, she's an angel. She's a, uh, I can't remember the exact name, but she is a, for foster kids. A casa? Yes. And so she does advocacy for foster children. And she actually, um, the foster child, and she contacted me and I had, I had no idea of the level of disability. So the, the young, the 12 year old boy had no use of his hand unless they were on his lap. And so he couldn't adjust the hand tilt with his hands. He couldn't adjust the focus. So this is what I built for him. So this is an electric hand tilt. It swivels and it tilts. This is just to raise it to his eye level. These are just to make, um, you can raise it up or down with an accordion. And again, this is my MacGyver. I have no idea. This is all just different parts. And this little thing here is the radio control for the focus. This is the wire control. So with these in his one hand, he can control the focus and he can control the hand tilt. And um, I also built a similar one for a gentleman in, in Austin. So my hope is to inspire others to consider using that converting equipment. Long term, I hope that one or more of my optic companies, or one or more optic companies, not my company, will create and sell equipment to help those with mobility challenges. So I really do believe in you know, if you put it out there, um, the universe will bring people to you. So I got an email, um, it's been six months. He is a uh, PhD student, occupational therapist, PhD student, who's also involved in vertibility. He's doing his thesis on adaptive burning equipment. And so I have a website that uh, I put all this stuff, and I told him, you use any and all of it. You know, whatever you come up with, because, you know, it, it's really helping me, but I love others that don't even consider um, burning as something that they would do to, to get into. So, yeah, burning is therapy. Mm -hmm. That's the end of it. So, I'm going to come up from, and then I'm going to kind of show you what my articulated. Arm. So this wheelchair doesn't have the hand tilt, but so I got really jealous of the two things. I wanted to be a photographer, but I also wanted to see birds close up. So I combined them. This is my spotting scope. This is my super zoom camera, all of five hundred dollars, but it's got an eighty-three times zoom. And the nice thing is, at eighty-three times, you can't hold it with your hand because it's too shaky. So this gives me a, a platform. It also has a articulated uh, LCD screen. So as I'm looking at a bird and adjusting, they both move at the same time. And the bird will be pretty close in here. I gotta move it a little bit. But I can actually be taking photos and looking through the scope at the same time. So it, it's so rewarding. So one, 
the 83 times Zam is so good for IDing birds you don't know at a far distance because you can go like, I have no idea. You go back and you go look at it like, yeah. The other day, <clears throat> I was out at Bob Lane and it was a really bad light. And I'm like up like this and I'm snapping and I couldn't figure it out. I put it on. So um, our Sacramento Audubon has a Facebook. And I said, I zoomed in on it and the top bill had this little teeny uh, hook to it. So I'm thinking, is that an immature loggerhead trike? It didn't, it didn't, you know, the, the, the markings weren't there. And so I put it out and I said, is this an ash-throated ash flycatcher or an immature? And it ended up being a um, western wood peewee. But I would have never ID'd it without the camera. Because one, even though this thing tilts, and even my, even though my wheelchair tilts, at, when it was like this, it was like, no, no I'm not going to be able to see it. So I didn't even see it. I, I got it with this. So, I mean, and then in my all-terrain chair, um, it, it really helps because I can tilt back and I can view, you know, probably about 40 degrees is, is probably a good viewing angle. But one of the big things um, that I realized, and it's a little different in somebody that's using equipment like this from a wheelchair, and that is the type of bird. So the gal that got me into Audubon Marine, she's 80 years old, you never know that she looks 55 and has energy of five people. She doesn't like to slow bird. And I realized that because she's like, okay, we gotta go. We gotta go, we gotta go. And I'm like, well, you know, Marie, if we're walking, she can turn sideways or behind in a second to see a bird, right? And so then I realized, and I've only been out with this equipment for less than a year now, and only so many ships with people. And what I'm realizing is there is a real dichotomy between adaptive birding equipment and the way you bird and somebody who's fully ambulatory with binoculars and can pivot and are, has been using binoculars for 20 or 30 or 40 years and it's, it's an appendage, it's like, oh yeah, that's a, oh that's a. And so that's when I got really uh, interested in the slow birding because the way that I bird, when I bird by myself, which is most of the time, is I'm birding at a really good distance. You know, I've got my scope so I can be out 30, 40 yards without a bomb, why can I be any type of bird? And so what I do is I go very slow and I try to ID the, the, either the trees or the terrain that's 40 degrees or lower and I'll slowly move up and I'll just wait. And, and you know, most of the time the birds within that 20 feet to, to 30 yards have already flushed or if they're curious about you, they look at you and then they flush. What I found is the ones, the birds a little bit further out aren't as spooked. And so what I'm trying to do is, is get people to realize, and especially in, as I'm leading trips, that it's a little different. And that um, if there's a bird in the side, what I'll do is I'll say, hey, can you take a look at that and see where it is? Because by the time I move my chair and my equipment, the birds are gone. So the mindful birding, this is what Amanda is doing with you guys, it, it really fits in that with the type of birding that, that you're doing because with the monopod in, in the seated position, what you can do is move to a vantage point and then go, okay, I'm gonna bird in a span area at nothing higher than 40 degrees and then once there's nothing there, we'll move forward a little bit. As opposed to the typical, just slowly meandering, you know, okay, birds show up, what have you. So it's, it's just a different way and different type of bird. So, um, so tomorrow, I'm super excited. I know I'm gonna have probably four or five lifers. We're gonna go to the Point Globos. And um, uh, Bev is coming, it'll be the first time that she's using the monopod. So that'll be really exciting. And um, I'm gonna open up for questions. Yeah.
how difficult is it for you to synchronize your camera and the slide scope to get the same image? So what I do is I'll choose something at a long distance and I will fix my spotting scope to it. And then the, the screw adapters to my camera, I have some slide capability. So I'll zoom in 83 times and I'll adjust it, take it off and tighten it. And it's only good for the distance that you're doing it. Oh. So they're, they're at 83 times zoom. So what I'll do is I'll bring it back. And so when it's at its least power, I'll see everything that's in here. But when it's at its highest power, sometimes it's out of the field of view. But it, what I've found very difficult with the super zoom is locating where the bird is in the viewfinder. So it's like, oh, there's the, there's. The. Yeah. <laughs> so what I've been doing is I'll start it all the way back and I'll take the whole tree in. And what I'm getting really good at is first ID an ID in the tree. Okay, it's the branch with the big green thing on it. Oh, there it is. Okay, and the bird is to the left of that. And so then I zoom in and I go over the bird and the bird moves. I'm like, crap, come back out. So I'm actually ordering, it's coming today. I, I, this scope uh, starts at, I think it's 20 power and then it goes up to like 60 or whatever. But it's really difficult at 20 power to close bird. Um, and so I found a scope that goes down to nine power. And, it, and so I'm gonna be trying that. It was, it was only a couple hundred dollars, so it wasn't that expensive. Um, and so that'll help. So as, as I'm uh, trying to figure out the right scope, but yeah, so I will fix an object and I'll get these aligned and, you know, and it really helps with like the, um, the uh, ruby crown kinglets that never stop. So it's really great because I can literally go, I mean, like I'm watching it and I'm like, I don't see it at all. I only see it in here because I can follow it around. But if they're too close, then the 20 power, I can't see it. And so I, I'm going to play around with a little lower power scope for that. Don't use binoculars much anymore? So I don't. So the advantage of the scope, well, so if, if and you'll find this out tomorrow. So when you have binoculars adjusted at the right level, guess what? They're right in front of your eyes. And so it's like, oh. Yeah. Uh -huh. So what I found is the scope is always lower than you. So, and, it, and for me, where my muscular chirp is, I can still do this very easily. Um, so I, I pretty much scrapped the binocular. What I love about the binoculars is I've got an eight power and a 10 power and the ability to really see, especially with the, 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 the fall migration, you know, they're popping through. You know, the Wilson warblers are there, they're, they're popping through. And so I've really got to be dedicated to finding them and then really spending time. So I'm going to use my lower power scope instead of my binoculars. Um, but I got away from the binoculars because they're up at eye level. And I actually, <laughs> the, the one thing I only used once, I, I made a, uh, uh, I don't know what call it, but it's a, uh, it's a battery operated. Um, yeah. No, it's a, uh, there's a name for it, but it's a, it's a shaft that moves up and down. So I attached that to the chair and it was because I had the vacuum. But then it was, oh, I need, I need to lower it. Okay, where's the bird? It's like, done, gone, done, gone. And, you know, and it's so funny because. When you talk to birders, it's like, you know, it's just birding. It's like, no. And this is what I was talking to the PhD student. I said, okay, be ready. The parameters that you have to put in your paper are huge. The speed, the movement, we all take for granted how quickly we can move. 
you know, fully ambulatory people. We all take for granted how easily you can get a pair of binoculars up and look. We all take for granted we can swivel 360 degrees. We all take for granted we can look. And I said, you need to take all those parameters into those are your variables. You have to bring them in. And then if you're going to be doing it at a PhD level, how do we rectify this? And then I said, okay, so you got those parameters. This is what it takes to be a burger. You have a half a second. You have to be able to swivel in every different direction. You have to be able to move optics to your eyes. You need to know what focus is. And I said, okay, and that's all for a fully functioning human being, which we are all, all not, but take your, you know, like the science class that I remember going in high school. He said, okay, this is all the perfect environment. I will tell you, what did you say? I will tell you how. If you want to know why, the religion department's down the street. You know, so, and I said, so then you've got to take the full gamut. You can have somebody that uh, has mobility issues, somebody that has um, shaking issues, somebody that, um, mental issues, somebody who might have, um, the word that I used is uh, bio, biodivergent, I think. Neurodivergent. Neurodivergent. So there's a, there's a whole range that I don't even know about. You know, you have the, the autistic, uh, that's not, what was the word again? Oh, neurodivergent. Yeah, and, and the neurodivergent scale is, there's so many different people with so many different ways that their brain processes that this PhD student needs to take into account. It's like if you are going to do your thesis on adaptive burning equipment, be prepared. And you know, I had him on Zoom until I couldn't talk anymore. And he's like, this like, like this. And I said, but you know what? I've got so much on my website and I'm here you know, and so I'm so looking forward to it. He emailed me a couple of weeks ago. I was like, okay, I'm still working on it. And I hope it isn't just a very simple because I, it's, it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. You mentioned uh, how mobility impaired. So how, how, what are the mobility, uh, visual impaired? So how, how do visually impaired people hurt? So again, with, you know, the optics. So, depending upon the level of visual impairment, you move into being a uh, auditory burden, where you're, you're burning literally by hearing everything. Um, but then, you know, like with most people, um, the use of optics is necessary because, you know, everybody doesn't have 20 vision. So, but I don't know the, that level of, you know, at what point you actually can't use optics. Oh, good. So that's, I'm going to email the PhD student. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not a birder, so this, but I'm here. Um, so this might be a naive question, but um, how uh, different is the experience looking through a lens versus looking at a really high quality screen version of the view? I would say it's a thousand times different. So the first time that I looked through a high-end scope, it feels like you are standing in front of the bird and the colors and the, the complexity is mesmerizing. Now this little LCD screen isn't anything. What I'll compare that to is <clears throat> there's a, uh, there's a technique called uh, digiscoping, where you take your uh, digital camera uh, or your, your smartphone and you attach it to a scope. So with an iPhone, it's probably one of the highest pixelated screens that we see. And so I use that, and it's really cool, and especially for people that would have a real difficult time, that's another way that you know, again, the PhD student, it's, they could have even an iPad size where they could keep it in front of them and instead of having to look up, they could, you know, it's good. And I remember a hummingbird in my backyard where the light was perfect. And again, it's the light thing. So with the uh, 
chip size and the light uh, ability or the, the ability to to work in low low light. You know, our smartphones aren't really good with that. So I was watching a hummingbird in my backyard that was maybe 30 feet away at full power on my scope. And then on the iPhone, you can you can zoom in to 10 power. So I mean, it filled the screen. It's not the same. It's not the same. Seeing something in a scope, to me, is actually even better than seeing it up close. I, I, in my backyard, I've got a, a water, uh, a bird water, bird bath. And I could be 10 feet away, and that's amazing. But I would rather be 20 or 30 feet away and look at it with my scope. Mm -hmm. There's something about the coated, the coated lenses on the scopes that just bring that color to life. And just the eyelashes and the, and the eyes and the feet and the color of the toenails. And I mean, you can just sit and be mesmerized by a house sparrow for an hour. So, but, and again, PhD student, it's what are you capable of? So if you have somebody that um, has an extremely hard time, let's say somebody that has a real mobility issue, that they're, they've, they've got a, a muscular condition like you know, um, MS, where they're moving a lot, um, or Tourette's, or what have you. It's not my field. I talk about cars and traffic all day long, but <laughs> anyhow. So, but what I realized too, and that's where the mindful birding comes in. So if it's so difficult for you to use optics, or it's so difficult for you to just like, it's frustrating. Well, maybe just listening and seeing with your eyes, maybe with a nice pair of glasses is, because it has to do with getting goosebumps. And everybody gets goosebumps in different ways. Marine, my 80 year old gets goosebumps by saying good bird. Oh, that was a good bird. <laughs> it, you know, and or, you know, but I get goosebumps by just that nuance of seeing a bird that I didn't recognize a feature in it that I'm seeing. Somebody that has a really difficult time being in their body might just literally like being out and listening and not having to worry about all the apparatus. You know, because the apparatus, and that's one of the things that I learned, is schlepping stuff. So for a long time, God, I have so many stories. So my wife, who is my wonderful adventure girl, she was uh, doing the Inca Trail. And it's the first time that I realized I really needed an all-terrain wheelchair. So I bought this wheelchair from Florida that had balloon tires. And the look that she gave me when I went back to So I used that for years. And I used it with the monopod, and I laid the monopod on it, and I, because I found that, that these, had, it was really difficult pushing these for me over grass. And so the bigger wheels were easier for me to push over grass. But by the end of five hours, I was just frustrated. It was like I spent 90% of the time schlepping my equipment, Another 90% getting frustrated because by the time that I get everything set up, the bird's already gone. And so finding that right, and I think everybody in the birds can, can identify with this, finding what works for you so it isn't such a hassle. It's like, okay, I don't want to walk two miles. I don't want to walk down a steep. I don't want to do this. I want to go here because I want to be immersed in the birds. And until I got my all-terrain wheelchair with it set up and with everything so I didn't have to think about it. And then the other thing is getting your equipment from place to place. So I just recently got a mobility van and it was, that was like I told my wife, I said, I, I don't know who else in the world is excited about owning a soccer ball van, but I do. I love it. Because I had, we, my, my wife and I, we towed an Airstream. She drove, and we had the big old Mac Daddy truck, and that was what I would load the big wheelchair in the back. I had this big old ramp. And it was just, again, it was, it's inconvenient. 
when I got the mobility van, which has uh, the ramp that just comes out, and I got buttons, and I can be out. I was like, "Where are you going?" My wife. I'm just going birding. We just talked about this yesterday. I said, "I can. I can get in the mobility van. I can go bird for two hours. I will come back, and it's no big deal." So what I found with me is I found that sweet spot with all my equipment that isn't onerous. And I know when you were working on the modifier, I could tell it's like it's like it, it's frustrating. And until you get to that point where whatever burning equipment that you're using is not part of your mental process. It's your appendage. It's how you burn. And so, and that's kind of what I really want to work with this PhD student is there's not one way of adaptive burning that fits everybody. Everybody's going to be different. And it's until you find that. And I finally I found it with all, you know, I spent so much time and so much effort and thought I was crazy. You know, the guy in the garage was like, what are you doing again? Are you doing that again? And I go to the park and he's like, did you build that? Did you build that? It, but because, and all the motivation wasn't from an ego standpoint. I can build this, this is great, I feel good about building it. It was, I wanted to, and I used the word immersive birding one time in a Zoom meeting, and everyone was like, what the hell is immersive birding? I said, for me, it's what I'm doing now. It's the fact that I can go out for four hours, and literally, it's all about the birds. I'm not worried about the train, I'm not worrying about loading, I'm not worrying about my equipment. I'm out there, and I'm picking up all the details. You know, um, when I was out the other day, I saw, um, what was it, Jason? Like? It was a hummingbird just coming down, and it was Ashloaded, Ashloaded flycatcher sitting on a dead branch, and this hummingbird is just, <laughs> and I'm like, so what is all that about? Is it just, you know? A peculiar hummingbird it's like don't I don't want you here or and and so if I had been schlepping I'd have missed it and it's all it's all that nuance that I think adds to the, the enjoyment all right so I mean are there any other projects that you're working on uh, like you have a wish list or anything with respect to <laughs> it's chasing the train with yeah. my dystrophy. So, so my the dystrophy that I have um, will have plateaus. So, you know, different muscle groups will not atrophy. So, I'll have the ability. So, I think for right now, because everything's supported, and and so far I can do all this. Um, you know, I've got a. a there's a local group with people with my condition that you know they don't have this ability, they can't do this. So what I would move into, so with um, Eric from Austin, he has a different form of muscular dystrophy. He would be where I might be in the future. And so I built for him a pan tilt electric that sits, he's got a, a tray on his, uh, electric wheelchair and you know and it's so funny because he's he's a uh, an amazing writer he, he, he went he, he, he's been writing these articles and his frustration is not being able to see all the birds so there's there's a limit and so I realize that if I have to move into something that's all electric again I'm going to be changing the way I'm burning but I, I think I'm not so much concerned about that. So what I'm what my passion is right now is to help as many people as I can. And the interesting thing is, as usual, most people in the birding community are ambulatory. Most people that are ambulatory don't consider birding as something that they would can do. So what I'm trying, and I'm, I've been talking to various people, it's like, okay, so how can we really attract people that 
with a range of physical conditions that never considered that they can burn. Because again, the last thing I ended up with is burning this therapy. And the more articles I read about, so in Japan, the translation is they call it forest bathing. So when you're out, your your cortisol levels drop. And I'm thinking, how wonderful. And so my big push, this next push, isn't going to be on the equipment. It's going to be trying to really reach out. I don't, and it's, it's, there's a, there's a balancing act for me. I don't want to be a babysitter. To fill somebody's time who doesn't really have a passion for birth, that just wants to kill a Saturday and I've got three people and that's the last time I ever see them again. And so what I'm trying to figure out is what is the right formula? And I think mindful birding is probably the best because there's mindful birding is just getting individuals out. So it'd be mindful birding with individuals that have various mobility issues. So, okay, come on out. And the initial mindful birding, I think I'll be able to figure out, it's like when I met Deb, it's like, oh, she's a birder. And I can, you can sense that. And not just somebody who wants to come, because I don't, I love my bird. I love my solo bird. But I have to say from a heart perspective, I really love what I've been doing. The giving back is, is just as many goosebumps as seeing a great bird. And so I really want to try to foster getting more and more people into this wonderful thing that we do with looking at birds um, that never considered doing it. So that's really my focus right now is, is outside because I think I've reached all that. The other focus though was, I was telling Amanda, you know, my wife, you know, she, when there is one thing on her brain, it, it can't, she doesn't stop. So there was always like, you're going to be out here and you're going to do this, you're going to have to worry about you. So now with this expensive four wheel drive and it's made so it's out of that, she's like, she's not worrying about me. And I said, well, hon, what happens if my very expensive wheelchair breaks? Yeah. She goes, well, that's up to you. I said, <laughs> but, and so I, that was another thing that I looked into. It's like, okay, well, what is the assistant love? And so I found out that 911, our emergency services, if you are, if, you're, if your chair is necessary to you to move, they will come out and get you and your chair. And the fire department will figure out what that is. They will send out four big fire dudes and pick you up, or they'll get a truck and whatever. So um, as I move into this, that's, that's the other, there's the safety, there's the, just the practicality issue of, oh great, Miller got four people out in the middle of Kasumas, that's a half a mile away from anything, and three of the wheelchairs broke. So 911 is my rectification to that. So as I move into trying to get other people, because you know, I, I'm not in the medical profession. I, I'm not occupational therapist. There's so many of the nuances of, if I invite people out that have various conditions, I gotta be really safe. I gotta be really aware that I'm not putting people in harm's way. And the 911 was a, and it took me a long time. I, I called fire departments, I called police departments. I finally found a wonderful dispatch person who was able to you know, she says, okay, I gotta figure this out. And she says, I'm not sure. And she asked her now, she called me back, she goes, yeah. So what I found out is, at least here in Sacramento County, if you call 911, tell the dispatch that your wheelchair broke and you are, the wheelchair is necessary for you, they will determine the right emergency services. And they said most, most of the time it's gonna be the fire department, but there's Cal Fire and other, other things that possibly. So, and so I also would like, you know, regardless of whether it's here in Monterey, but, you know, 
Uh, Amanda is doing wonderful mindful birding, and Bev, you're starting to really dig into the adaptive and accessible birding. If you know anybody, or just bring it up in the conversation, because I think it's the word of mouth is going to get more and more people that wouldn't even consider birding something. And I think the mindful birding is the door, because even um, we, we, were we talking about your, a little bit of insecurity on leading a trip? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, we're zooming with Bev, and I, and, you know, she goes, "You're a motivational speaker." I said, "No, I just I I'm German." So I said, "You know, you should really start leading trips." And she says, "Well, I, I don't know all the birds." And I said, "You know what? It doesn't matter. I do." And now with all of the, you know, it doesn't matter. Get out there and say, as a group, we're going to figure it out. And then even more, Amanda, with the mindful birding, which is so much less about identifying the individual bird, but just enjoying it, that might be the way, as people put the word out, to get them initially into the mindful birding, and if they get put there, get them into the accessible birding trip, where it isn't about hiding the birds initially, Although, I, I don't know, I went down the rabbit hole, and so I, like, I'm gonna have lifers, and I, I have so many lists going, and I love it. So, and this is where um, mindful birding is very interesting, because I do find it very compelling to learn more and more, and list more and more, because it's, it's really enjoyable. But the mindful birding is too, and I kind of get that just, in between when I'm out looking at birds, it's like, okay, when I'm not seeing a bird, I'm out enjoying everything, including the bugs and everything else. And um, so, I don't know where I'm going with that, but anyway, so. Well, thank you, Paul. I don't have to clean up this water if you want it, but I think your approach there about, you know, just kind of taking into account how everybody's so different and that there's, you know, it's not just, Everybody's mobility issues can be different, or be a, a neurodivergent thing. But and even you know, just every single person that's on a bird walk, I need to try to remember that when I'm thinking about binoculars, it's not what they're seeing. And he's saying, you know, you turn on a pin and you're swiveling and looking and ID. Right. And that's just so important as a trip leader, I think, for me to be super, you know, like just empathetic of just, you know, everybody's perspective is different. Right. And you know, that's maybe for all of life. <laughs> we should get around to that, how everybody's different. Different perspectives, but that's so helpful. I think for trip leaders, yep. keep that in mind on their walks, and just try to make sure everybody feels included and you get lots of different, you know, options on how to see the bird or explain the bird or ID the bird or how are we going to get down the trail or doing this as a team